the Greater Rochester Health Foundation, working to pursue and invest in solutions that build a healthier region where all people can thrive. Good evening, I'm Evan Dawson, and thanks for joining us for WXXI's live forum, Fighting COVID-19. Tonight, we give you the opportunity to hear from medical researchers based right here in Rochester. Their work in vaccine development, in clinical trials for treatment, and simply in understanding how this disease spreads and who's most vulnerable. This is the kind of work that will impact you, it will impact our community, and the impact will go far beyond that. We've been assembling our questions and yours all week. We're going to ask them Later today, uh, later tonight in this program, we'll have a chance to sort through those questions as well. But we want to emphasize something right off the top here that we take very seriously. We take physical distancing seriously and safety guidelines seriously. I'm in my own studio. Our guests are very much separated from one another. We have a small crew here. They are wearing masks and they are wearing gloves. And we follow all of the guidelines very seriously tonight. Let's get to it. Let's welcome our guests who are here with us. Dr. Nancy Bennett is a professor of medicine and public health sciences at the University of Rochester Medical Center, founder and director of the Center for Community Health and Prevention, and co-director of the Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Dr. Angela Branch is an assistant professor in infectious diseases in the Department of Medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center and co-director of the URMC Vaccines Trial and Evaluation Unit. Dr. Ann Falsey is an infectious disease specialist with Rochester Regional Health, a professor of infectious diseases in the Department of Medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center, and co-director of the URMC Vaccine Trials and Evaluation Unit, and Dr. Dave Topham, a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the Center for Vaccine Biology and Immunology, and director of the New York Influenza Center of Excellence at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Later in the hour, we will be joined by Dr. Michael Mendoza, Monroe County Commissioner of Public Health. He's going to be listening this hour, and he's going to help us understand how the research you're about to hear about can be sort of pulled together as we create new guidelines and direct public health and policy going forward. Just a reminder, you can submit questions if you'd like. We've been getting them all week from you, but if you want to do that throughout the hour, the email is forum at WXXI.org. You can tag us, WXXI News, on Facebook and Twitter, and again, we'll address that later in the hour. First, I'd like to turn to each of our guests, and I'd like to start with Dr. Dave Topham. Earlier in the week, Dr. Topham, you told us that the coronavirus presents essentially a unique challenge, a monumental challenge for the research community, much different scale than what we saw in 2009, for example, with H1N1. Why is that? Why is it unique and such a monumental challenge? Well, I think the first uh, attribute that this virus has is that it's completely new to the human population. Nobody has protective immunity against it, and that's what's allowing it to spread uh, so easily. You know, in 2009, when we had the H1N1 pandemic, although it was a new influenza virus, it was still uh, somewhat related to other influenza viruses that had circulated in people in the past. And so some segments of the population had pre-existing immunity, and that gave them a certain degree of protection. Uh, so it was, you know, quote unquote, a mild pandemic. It actually, it, I, I, I don't agree that it was a completely mild pandemic, but mm -hmm. that's the perception. Whereas this, uh, the COVID-19 virus is is a, a really scary because it's true, we, we, we don't have any immunity. Nobody is protected. Dr. Falsey, you've said it is important for the American public and really the whole world community to try to be patient as research does its job, good science does its job. But at the same time, you've said, looking around the research community, this is lightning speed compared to a lot of what we're used to. How do you find a balance as a researcher, knowing the worldwide community wants everything done yesterday, but there does need to be time for good research and science to take place? Right, right. It's it incredibly difficult to be patient in a situation like this. But, um, you know, I've been doing vaccine research uh, and antiviral research for over 30 years. And again, it, it's my perception that things are moving like light speed. So what you want to do is cut down on sort of needless bureaucracy and paperwork while proceeding in a careful manner to protect people, that safety is still very important for the volunteers. 
Uh, Dr. Branch, ultimately, as you've described it, there are three pa possible paths we're going to see out of this pandemic. Uh, we could see a rather rapid development of antivirals, effective therapies. Uh, we could see an effective vaccine, and certainly we all hope we will eventually. Uh, or the population could develop herd immunity. Which of those outcomes stands out to you as the worst case, the one that concerns you the most? Um, I'd have to say herd immunity, um, even though it's sort of the most natural approach um, to halting the pandemic. Um, it does mean that a lot of people will have to get ill in order for enough people to develop protection um, that would lead to sort of more widespread um, protection of transmission uh, within a community. Uh, so that's certainly the, the outcome that we're trying to avoid. We don't want to see lar large numbers of, numbers of people get infected um, and then and subsequent uh, mortality associated with that. And Dr. Branch, just to follow up, we heard Governor Cuomo talking today about some early data from antibody testing. And I know that we need much broader sample sizes um, and it's going to take some time. But it looks like in this state it is possible that we're in the double digits of people who've been infected from COVID-19, uh, with the coronavirus, I should say, and having COVID-19. And so initially, a lay person like me sees that and thinks, well, maybe there's more of us infected than we thought. Maybe that's a good thing. But we're still, even if that's true, even if it's 13% statewide, even if it's 20% New York City, that's still a very small number compared to where we would need to get to with herd immunity. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, there are 300 million people in the United States. Um, we don't really know exactly what percentage of them have to be infected in order for there to be enough herd immunity within a community um, to slow down transmission and to um, really be effective. Um, but I would say it's, it's definitely a lot more than what we're seeing right now. Um, and I, I think uh, we're really far from that. Dr. Bennett, you know, life in this country in the last six weeks has changed pretty quickly, pretty dramatically. Um, and in a sense, what we're doing, as you and I talked about earlier this week, is we're playing defense against the virus. We're, we're staying in our homes, most of us. We're not going to work as instructed by public health leaders. We're not really assembling in public. But Dr. Mendoza will talk later this hour about the fact that, you know, we can't really play defense forever. We have to kind of get to a point where we can try to play offense against the virus. What does that look like to you when we start to shift that before a vaccine? I think it's very complicated and difficult, and uh, many people around the country are trying to determine what we would need to have in place to safely go back to work and go back to social events. I think we're beginning to see a little bit of light. Um, we are seeing more testing, although that's been very difficult. Uh, for the virus itself, so being able to identify people who are sick, trace their contacts, isolate the case, and also quarantine the contacts. Uh, we are also now seeing, as you mentioned before, some serologic testing, which can determine whether or not people have been previously exposed to the virus. The problem is, is we don't know what the serologic testing means yet. We don't know how high a titer you need to have or how long it has to last to keep you protected. So there are a lot of things that need to be in place that are not currently in place before we can go back to our norm normal activities. Earlier this week, uh, on Connections on the radio, we talked to Congressman Tom Reed. We heard Governor Cuomo talking today about phased reopenings. And we're going to talk some this hour about what that really means, because it doesn't mean what life was like on March 1st. But there does seem to be a growing consensus that different parts of the state and different parts of the country would make moves before others. Is that a fair statement? Do you think that that's probably a logical move? Yeah, I do definitely think that's true. Um, just as you were discussing before, uh, while New York City may have had 21 percent of its population exposed already to this virus, in upstate it's only 3.6 percent. So clearly the epidemic is happening in a geographic way, and, and we need to be attentive to the particulars of any certain region and, and really think very hard about what the capability of that region is. And before we move into a vaccine conversation, I just want to bring D Dr. Topman back for one more point here, because as you stress to the audience that this challenge is different, that this is not a, a flu strain, that this is not something that there is even much of a basis to start with, I think I'd like to hear just a little bit more about what that might mean going forward now that we are at least trying to get a look at what, how the coronavirus sort of behaves and what we're learning. How much do you feel like at this point in this, I don't want to call it a game, this is not a game, but this far along, how much do we know versus what we don't know and how much do you see that changing week by week here? Uh, we, 
the, you know, what we don't know far exceeds what we do know. Um, and even the things that we do know are a little bit murky. As uh, Dr. Bennett just mentioned, uh, we're doing serological testing, but we don't quite know what that serological testing means. What is a protective level of antibody? Uh, it, does the antibody actually last uh, long enough to protect us uh, through next winter? Um, there's also some concerns that antibodies to coronaviruses can actually enhance infection. Um, and how do you make sure you get the right response? Uh, I think that, you know, studying the actual infections, people that are protected, will inform us a great deal as we move forward with developing vaccines and tests to understand how those vaccines are working. But we have a lot to learn. Uh, this is this is uh, all new territory for us. Well, let's talk about a vaccine, and I want to bring in Drs. Branch and Falsey for this portion of the conversation. And uh, Dr. Falsey, I'll start with you. Uh, we've heard, of course, there are many different vaccine trials happening, dozens around the world, in various stages of testing being rolled out, really essentially as safely and scientifically sound, but also as fast as they can. Tell us about the work that is happening here as part of the team that you're on. Well, so uh, Dr. Branch and I are part of a network called the VTEUs, the Vaccine Treatment and Evaluation Units, and we are involved in the development of uh, what we call phase one studies that uh, where a brand new vaccine is introduced into um, a small number of people primarily for safety uh, before it moves on to larger numbers of people looking at immunogenicity and finally um, phase three trials, which are a ways off where you look to see if it's truly effective. What is the um, sort of the realistic expectation for, you know, for the lay public, again, evaluating this? We hear dozens of trials around the world. What's the realistic expectation that the work you're doing that you feel that in the next 6, 12, 18 months is going to produce the kind of results that everyone is hoping to see? Well, you know, I think it's always important to remember whether or not a vaccine is a winner or a loser. You're learning something about the immune response along the way. So while the vaccine that we test locally may not be the one that eventually is given to millions of people, um, it's definitely a step in the process. So we feel very good about it being being part of the solution. Dr. Branch, the most common question we seem to get is one that I suspect you hear quite often, which is, how fast can you do this? How fast till a vaccine? How fast? Um, and I think it's going to be helpful for our viewers and listeners tonight to understand a little bit of the history. In our conversations before this program, you talked about what has kind of been average throughout history, what we've seen maybe the efforts with Ebola, compared to what NIH and researchers are trying to do right now around the world. Can you give us a little context for what we typically see versus what's happening now? Sure. Uh, so most of the time, most vaccines take about 10 years at minimum to develop. Um, and the majority of that time is spent in what we call preclinical trials. Um, that's understanding um, the vaccine and, and putting it into animal models and seeing how safe it is and how efficacious it is. And that, that process itself can take about 10 years. Um, and then it moves into phase one and then eventually phase two and phase three trials. And that typically takes another two to five years, depending on how large the trials are and where they're being conducted and how quickly you can get them uh, underway and, and how the, what role the FDA is playing in all of this. Um, so on average, to get a va from start to finish, a vaccine, um, vaccine development process takes about 10 years. Uh, during the Ebola crisis, um, the Ebola epidemics, um, there was actually an accelerated vaccine um, development plan for Ebola um, in the event that it ever spread worldwide. Um, and that accelerated plan was actually five years. Um, obviously, a five-year timeline wouldn't be appropriate for a pandemic like we're dealing with now. Um, and it wasn't what was done in the 2009 pandemic either. Um, but uh, hoping to have a vaccine within a year or within the two years is extremely optimistic. Um, and it's something that certainly scientists are working hard at all over the world. Um, but it would be something that we haven't seen before, that sort of rapid development of a brand new vaccine um, with no prior um, measures to, to look at. So let me ask both Dr. Branch and Falsey then, what does the research community need to see before people like me are in a line waiting to get a shot in our arm, maybe in 2021, but what does the community, Dr. Branch, need to see to say, yes, mass produce it, get it out there, let's do it? So as I said, as you know, as Dr. Falsi said, and as you mentioned, there are so many vaccines that are in preclinical or clinical trial right now. I just looked at 
um, some data that said there are about 115 vaccine candidates that are either in preclinical or clinical trials. Um, right now, I think there's six as of today, and another study um, just went into human populations uh, this morning in England. Um, and the timeline for some of these vaccines um, is, is very quick. Um, the first a vaccine study to be done here um, in the United States. Um, it's been it's been conducted by the NIH with a company called Moderna, um, and from January 11th, when the sequence of the virus was published, um, to when the vaccine was first given to a human subject um, in mid March, it was about two months. So that's actually really quick to move into phase one trial. Uh, the phase one study is actually closed right now, and they're moving into phase two and phase three. Um, and the current um, timeline, if this vaccine is successful, um, is that it could potentially be licensed as early as next um, winter in uh, January, February, March time. Um, so if that, if that indeed is a successful vaccine, um, that would be a really quick timeline of about 13 or 14 months. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, we've never seen that happen before. So I don't know um, if it's really realistic, um, but it's certainly the goal. So, Dr. Falsey, why don't you weigh in on that as well, knowing that, you know, this is where sort of that push-pull comes back into play, where the public wants it as fast as you can. And probably people who are not scientists will say, hey, if, if you're through phase two of this thing and people look like, you know, it, it's working out, can't you fast-track this thing? What do you as a researcher and what do you think the scientific community, what are those barriers before we are putting this in our arms in big numbers? Well, the, the other thing to remember is that the um, assays to look at what's called immunogenicity, antibodies and neutralization, are, are actually being developed in real time as the vaccine candidates are going forward, which is, is a situation we've never had before. So all of this is moving ahead sort of simultaneously. So you have to know, first of all, is it safe? And so you have to have it in a large enough group that an uncommon side effect would become obvious um, before you'd be putting it into millions of people. In addition, you would want to know that it is producing the proper kinds of antibodies. So Dr. Um, Topham mentioned that you, you want the right kind of immune response. So you want uh, antibodies that actually bind to and neutralize the antibody, uh, the virus. And, and so that'll be very important. We, we have a little bit of a leg up with some of these vaccine candidates in that it's a real uh, molecular designer world. So some of these vaccines were used, the platform was used for other um, pathogens such as Zika virus or MERS. And so uh, the scientists can engineer a new uh, antigen in. So we do have some safety data using other pathogens with similar types of viruses. Let me also just follow up because I think some of our viewers and listeners will start to hear more about uh, an issue that's come up in the last week. 35 members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, including Donna Shalala, former uh, head of HHS, uh, sent a letter to the FDA and the Department of Health and Human Services this week arguing in favor of what are called vaccine challenge trials. As I understand it, a challenge trial is a different kind of vaccine trial where you, know, you give someone a vaccine that's in trial and then you intentionally infect them with a virus uh, to see what happens. And it's a challenge trial because you're challenging them with the actual virus. The concern about COVID, of course, is there's not a cure. So if I receive a vaccine and I'm part of a challenge trial and they give me the virus and the vaccine has not worked, then I could be very sick or I could die. Now, the goal, of course, would be to surround them with good medical care, and, but you're starting to see more momentum in certain places. The head of Harvard, Harvard's Mark Lipsitch saying, do challenge trials, but a lot of others are saying, not ethical, don't do this. Uh, doc, Dr. Falsey, I'll ask you, do you expect to see any challenge trials with this vaccine? Well, I, I don't think so. Um, again, this is a, a virus to which nobody is immune, and we've seen that it can be extremely deadly. So without an effective antiviral, uh, it would be unethical to expose someone to the pathogen without knowing that that vaccine you've given them supposedly for protection is effective. I, I think that um, animal models are reasonable. The macaque model is a pretty good uh, surrogate. And you can do some of those challenge studies in animal models. As much as we, we love our animal friends, um, I think it's a much better way forward than uh, intentionally infecting uh, people. You have to protect 
the individual volunteers right. It, it, it can't be said, well, it's for the greater good, and we'll, we'll sacrifice a few people along the way. Hmm. Dr. Branch, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's so much we don't know about the natural history of this virus. Um, and in reality, even though there may be young, healthy people who don't get a severe disease, um, we're still seeing people in their 30s and their 40s in the hospital who um, get severely ill. In, in the past, challenge studies, at least when influenza, have been done with um, attenuated strains of influenza where the virus is made weaker. Um, we don't have that background or that knowledge or that history to draw on with COVID-19. Um, so we wouldn't even begin to know what to challenge them with um, and then how they would respond to that. All right. Well, a vaccine, of course, is not the only focus of research that's happening here. We're starting to hear more about antibody testing, as we mentioned earlier in the program. I want to bring Dr. Bennett back in for some thoughts on the idea of playing offense, of going back to work and getting a sense of how much the population might already be infected. Um, what are the, the most important questions that you have before we can feel confident that we know, number one, that antibody testing is going to be pretty effective and that we're getting a better picture of what's happening in our community? I think we need to um, combine antibody testing with uh, also testing for the virus. We can't have one or the other because we can't really understand the pattern of disease in the community. Um, one of the studies that we're involved with is a 14-site study looking at hospitalizations and really trying to understand better who gets hospitalized, why they get hospitalized, and what their clinical course is. As, as everyone has said over and over, we really know very, very little about this virus, so we need to understand the course of illness. I think that um, there's no doubt that more people in our population have been exposed to this virus than we know. We've only been testing a limited number of people. Um, in the Rochester area, there have probably been about 1,000 people tested. Um, and we, or, sorry, 10,000 people tested um, and about 1,000 pos positive. But we really know very little from those few tests because we're not testing people routinely. We're not testing all patients. We haven't been able to really look at the entire community. So it'll be a long time before we understand all of those patterns. But collecting very careful, clean data on the spread of the virus is critically important to understanding where we go from here. Yeah, today Dr. Fauci was saying he's a little concerned that when we talk about testing ramping up, that we speak of it sort of monolithically without recognizing that we need reagents, we need swabs, you need a lot of different components in the supply chain, not just the test kits. I mean, it's every little thing that goes into it, and you need them in pretty big numbers, and you need people who could administer them before communities feel like, okay, we're ready, we're at a different level. Do you feel like we're getting close to that here? I think we have quite a ways to go. I think that I talk to my laboratory colleagues who tell me that they still are having difficulty with reagents. We do have difficulty with uh, the swabs that we need to do the testing. Um, one of the experts on testing in New York State uh, was talking yesterday and saying that in her lab, they basically run a whole series of different kinds of tests because then if she runs out of reagents for one test one day, she can use a different test and vice versa. So. I think we're quite a ways from feeling like we have a really firm testing infrastructure. And when you think about the numbers that we need to be able to track people over time, it's kind of overwhelming. I mean, it's, it's very large numbers. And certainly knowing that people have antibody would be helpful. But again, we don't know what that antibody means. So even discovering antibody in someone means that they will need to have repeat antibody testing as well. And Dr. Bennett, of course, antibody tests show us who might have already been infected, but what we're starting to see where we can get the data are some disparities. You know, certainly Chicago, Milwaukee were some of the early cities to release this kind of data. We have some uh, demographic data here. What we're seeing where we can get the data is there are disparities by race in terms of who has died from COVID-19, who's on a ventilator. Now, in this county, as far as I understand it, the numbers of those who have died of COVID-19 is pretty reflective of the general population. Those on a ventilator, there are racial disparities, but maybe at least for the moment in this community, the disparities are not as large as we're seeing in other places. But those disparities are real. What, do you, what are your biggest concerns? What do they tell us? And, and what are you looking for there? 
Well, I think uh, the data are fairly clear that not only are African Americans and Latinos being infected more with this virus, but they are also having difficult courses um, and are dying at higher rates. But I think it's important to note that, that they're being infected in the first place more frequently, or at least according to the testing data we have so far. Uh, the New York State that was data that was released today also showed that African Americans are being exposed more than uh, white members of of our state. Um, so this suggests that uh, the problem is not just the usual health disparities that we see in our community, but also an exposure problem. And that probably is due to the fact that many of our um, uh, communities of color are also people who are in essential jobs in our communities. So they're still doing their jobs. They're still going out. They don't have the luxury to work from home. So thus the higher rates of exposure. But combining that with our traditional disparities in uh, health status in our community creates a very disturbing picture that we're very concerned about. And I want to talk a little bit about age as well here. I, I will just say as a parent myself, I mean, if there is any blessing that parents feel is that this virus tends not to, and I will not say never, but tends not to target severe infections at children. It doesn't mean kids can't be carriers. Mm -hmm. But we do see in our community, we're approaching 100 deaths in this community, mm -hmm. the vast majority people in older age ranges, but we're seeing infections across the board. What are you seeing? Does this line up maybe where you expected it to be about a month ago? It is pretty similar to what we had heard from um, China and also from Europe which is that the people that are being most severely infected are the elderly um, and also people with chronic conditions. And this uh, chart can show you the hospitalization rates by age um, for a period of time in our, our community. And uh, excuse me, this is actually from across the country. And what you can see is that hospitalization is much more common in older individuals. Well, let me turn to Dr. Dave Topham, who is part of a team at URMC that has launched a new study that's trying to understand how the body's immune system responds to COVID-19. And Dr. Topham, to do this, you need participants in this community. Let's start with what you do need and how you're trying to get it. Uh, so we're looking for um, otherwise uh, healthy subjects who have mild disease, so they're being treated as outpatients. Um, as you've probably heard, this virus infection presents uh, with a huge range of, uh, uh, of symptoms from asymptomatic to uh, severe symptoms. But if somebody thinks that they're even just a little bit off, we'd like to hear from them, even if they don't fit the classic criteria. We'd like to hear from them. We'd like to test them and see if they're uh, actually infected with the virus. Um, you know, there are questions about, you know, how do immune responses correlate with disease severity? And that really goes in both directions. Um, do, do some people already have some pre-existing immunity that we haven't uh, been able to measure yet that, that minimizes the severity of the symptoms they develop? Um, or are there immune responses that develop in infected subjects that actually harm them uh, and uh, create the symptoms uh, that they have and uh, end up putting them in the hospital? We really just don't know, but we have to start uh, somewhere uh, in terms of studying these subjects. And uh, we find that actually the, the starting with people that have mild disease um, actually gives us something measurable uh, that, we can, that we can study. Uh, the severe cases in people that are hospitalized, their immune responses are often uh, aberrant uh, or, or missing. Um, and that makes it harder to get a, re a real idea of what's going on in, uh, in most cases. As you said, the infection rate may actually be a lot higher than the hospitalization rate. And so we want to study the majority, the, you know, the, the, uh, the population that uh, is getting infected the most. Um, that will tell us a lot about what we should be looking for in a successful vaccine candidate. Um, it will also tell us uh, perhaps uh, signs that we can look for that predict whether somebody's going to progress to developing more severe disease if we can catch them early in the infection. All right, so you're looking for people with COVID-19, 100 or more candidates. So viewers and listeners, if this is you, if this is you in the future, or if this is someone that you know, Again, we're going to put the information on the screen, and I'll, I'll go ahead and read it aloud for those who are listening. The number to call is 585-273-3990, 273-3990. And there's an email you can use, vaccine underscore research underscore unit at urmc.rochester.edu. And Dr. Topham, 
if this gives you what you want, what's the most valuable piece of information you can take forward? Is it the durability of immunity from people who have been infected and recovered? Is it something else? Uh, well, there's a couple of things. One is just knowing the nature of the immune response that, uh, we, that you get from this infection. Uh, the second is the timing. Uh, when does it develop after you've uh, developed symptoms, and how long does it last? How does that correlate with the clearance of the virus itself? And then you get into questions of durability. Um, you know, with seasonal coronaviruses, we encounter these viruses throughout our life and can get reinfected. It, it may not be every year. It might be every three to five years. We don't know what's true and what's going to be the case with this new coronavirus. Uh, are you only immune and protected for a certain period of time and then your antibody levels drop off and you become susceptible again? So uh, those are the things that we need to know. We're going to need to follow these people in, uh, for the, a longer term uh, to see how durable that immunity is and whether they remain protective. And we'll measure that in the laboratory uh, by looking for antibodies that can neutralize the virus. And if you get the participants you need, how quickly do you think you can get some answers on that? Uh, it really depends on how qu quickly we can enroll the subjects. Uh, doing the assays takes a certain amount of time. Right now, we're frantically putting together the reagents and assays. Uh, as I was saying, you know, it's a new virus, so that means we have to create new assays, new reagents. Uh, new tests uh, that didn't exist before, and we have to validate them. We have to make sure that they work uh, as expected. But we could know, I think, quite a lot within, uh, I would say, six months. Wow. Um, if, if the enrollment goes as quickly as we would like it yeah. to. Yeah. Just remarkable how fast research uh, is trying to move here. And let's talk about another study. Let's talk a little bit about antivirals, treating COVID when someone already has it. Uh, many Americans have heard of hydroxychloroquine. Of course, that's being studied and, um, and used in different ways. There's a menu of other drugs in trials. And you might have heard recently a lot of talk about a drug called remdesivir. Let's bring Dr. Branch and Dr. Falsey back in. Let's talk about what's happening here to under understand remdesivir and whether it's effective against COVID. I'll start with Dr. Branch. What is the team doing in regards to remdesivir? So as part of the Vaccine Treatment and Evaluation Unit uh, uh, network, we've been one of many, many sites um, that was activated um, in mid, the beginning and middle of March to start studying this drug, remdesivir. Um, so what we've been doing at the University of Rochester Medical Center is what we call a placebo control trial. That's where um, we enroll patients, all of whom get routine standard care. Um, many of them are sick or are in the ICU or on ventilators um, and are pretty severely ill. Um, and half of them get drug remdesivir and half of them get placebo. And the reason why we do it that way is because we don't know for sure that remdesivir will work. In fact, remdesivir is an antiviral agent um, that was developed to treat Ebola, and it was studied against um, MERS coronavirus and found to have activity against MERS coronavirus and other coronaviruses. And so when we started having cases here in the United States, the NIH um, got together with um, the Infectious Disease Clinical Research Consortium, of which we're a member, and started to ask questions like, which drug should we study first? What potentially has the, uh, what has the potential to be active against COVID-19 and uh, particularly active against people with severe disease with COVID-19? Because that's really the goal um, when you start talking about antivirals to prevent severe disease, um, to allow for quicker recovery. And remdesivir was the one that was chosen. So it's currently in phase three trial. Um, we've enrolled um, a number of subjects at uh, URMMC. Um, and the, the first act of that study is actually closed right now. And we're in the process of starting to analyze data. And hopefully, we'll have data as soon as mid mid May. Mid-May, Dr. Falsey, again, back to the speed of this. Mid-May, you can start to get a picture, a better, clearer picture of remdesivir, whether it's an effective tool in this kit. There was a lot of talk about some studies that I think one came out of Chicago. This seems to me to be a little bit more comprehensive. Do you feel like by mid-May, we're going to have a better picture of where we are with remdesivir? Yeah, yes, I think we're going to have a much better picture. Um, so, some of the early information that you were hearing out of Chicago, that, that was not a placebo-controlled trial. And while it may be very hard for people to understand why you could give a placebo in people who are so ill, uh, just to reiterate what Dr. Branch said, we, we really don't know that it works. And the only way to get that information is to do this kind of trial. 
it enrolled so rapidly over one, the, in, the original intent was to enroll 440 people. It enrolled within a couple of weeks all around the world, uh, sadly because there were so many cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and the investigators wisely decided to continue enrollment, and that's because this will allow a large enough sample size so that you can do some very, very important subgroups. So there's a primary analysis, and then you know, this had a very broad inclusion um, picture. And so we could enroll people who were sick for two or three weeks. We could enroll people that were very, very ill and on ventilators because we really don't know, you know, whether it's going to work or not in different kinds of situations. Our experience with most antivirals is that if you treat earlier, it's better. But because we didn't know, there's broad criteria. So it enrolled um, uh, over 1,000 people, and so we will be able to do a very sophisticated analysis. And, and I think, you know, we will get an answer. It either works or it doesn't. And it may be that it doesn't work in everybody. It works in subgroups of people. Remarkable, again, maybe by mid-May to get some more information there. If you're just joining us, I'm Evan Dawson here at the WXXI studios with local experts in medical research. And again, we're emphasizing we are practicing safe physical distancing. I'm in my own studio. The guests are separated. We have a small crew wearing masks and wearing gloves. And we are making sure that we respect the safety and the guidelines here. We have a number of questions from viewers and listeners. We're going to get to as many as we can. And to our guests, I'm just going to sort of, you're all going to be capable of answering all these questions. I will sort of pick you at random, uh, but feel free to jump in to add if you'd like, and let's move through as many as we can here. First from Nicole. Nicole asks, what is the likelihood that there will be a second wave of infections of the virus, and do we know when that might happen? Um, let, let's ask Dr. Falsey to start with that. Well, I, I think unless we have widespread inf infection with herd immunity, uh, that it's, it's likely that we will have a second wave, especially if uh, things start opening up and people start congregating again. When it would happen, I think we have no idea. Um, we don't know that this will act like a seasonal influenza and come in the, the winter, so the, the second part of it I can't answer. Okay, and um, Dr. Bennett, is a, is a worst case of a second wave, does it look something like individual communities see a kind of a plateau and maybe a slow downward slope of infections, then there's a phased reopening in the next few weeks, few months, and it's not a careful reopening or reengagement, and we see a quick spike? Is that the kind of the bad kind? I mean, there's always, it's, all infections are not what we're looking for, but is that the most dangerous kind of second wave? I, I think that's what people are concerned about, that there could be reopening, uh, more congregating of people, and that we would see a big spike that would uh, endanger our health care system. So I think all of the plans that are currently being made in New York State are to really do uh, very careful and thoughtful work before we start um, getting together again. Uh, and I think that that will protect us from having that kind of um, uh, big resurgence. Uh, I think Dr. Falsey is really correct, and I would say the same, which is that it's extremely hard to predict when this would occur. Um, we don't have much evidence thus far that this is a seasonal virus. Um, we don't really think it's necessarily going to go away in the summer. Um, and so I don't know if that would occur in the fall or if it would occur in the summer when people start congregating more. I think one of the concerns that was expressed by the head of the CDC was having both COVID and flu circulating at the same time would produce a major burden on our healthcare system. All right, working through more questions, William asks us, is airborne infection happening and could that help explain what's happening in nursing homes, Dr. Bennett? Oh, um, have to give you're, me the hard one. You're laughing you? because you wanted me to go to your colleagues with this. I did. <laughs> this, um, is, this is a hard one, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think the microbiologists might be um, smarter about this than I am. Um, I think that we believe that most of the transmission is droplets. Um, I think that in nursing homes, there is, uh, it's a congregate living facility. It makes it very difficult to separate people. It's also... Uh, the staff are very engaged with the people who live there and taking care of them. I think our local nursing homes have uh, really done an outstanding job in protecting their um, 
uh, uh, patients. I think that it's a very hard job for them to do. And uh, the fact that we've had some uh, outbreaks is not surprising, uh, but I think we've uh, actually protected a lot of people as well. All right, just briefly then, Dr. Branch, aerosol uh, kind of transmission, do we know enough now to start to feel like we can describe that kind of transmissibility? Um, well, I think it's both aerosol and what we call fomites. I just read an article in the New England Journal of Medicine a few weeks ago um, that was trying to answer this question, how long, um, once it gets into the air and it lands on surfaces, does, it, does the virus stay alive on surfaces? Can it get on your clothes? Can it get on your hair and your beards um, and all these different things? Um, and my conclusion in, in reading some of those studies is that um, certainly the virus can be on hard surfaces, um, and so that's one way that it's being transmitted um, unintentionally. It can be on hands, um, which is why we emphasize hand washing so much. Um, it certainly can be aerosolized. It takes a lot for viruses to be aerosolized. You actually have to have a significant um, expulsion of um, oral or, or nasal secretions, and um, it has to have a lot of virus in it. Um, so that, I, I, think, um, I think the fomite role is playing a bigger mm -hmm. role than, than maybe we're appreciating. Dr. Topham, Gene asked the program the following. Do you think we will be living with coronavirus even after we have a vaccine and lots of testing? Do you think the virus will mutate like flu does and we will be thinking of a new vaccine every year to cover different strains of it? Dr. Topham. Actually, I don't think it's going to mutate like flu. Hmm. Um, current coronaviruses don't drift the way influenza virus drifts. Uh, in, in, influenza is actually quite unique, and even among influenzas, H3 viruses drift a lot more than H1s and influenza B strains. So no, I don't, I don't see that happening. Do I think it'll be with us for a long time? Yes, I think it's probably going to weave itself into the fabric of seasonal coronavirus uh, infections. Um, whether those infections will become more mild uh, or more severe is hard to answer. Most viruses over time actually uh, mutate in a way to be less pathogenic. And I mean, let's face it, it's not in the virus's interest to kill the host. It's better to keep them walking around uh, in public and infecting other people. That, that, that you know, it's called selfish, selfish uh, RNA or selfish DNA. Um, but uh, it, it's hard to answer. It, it, we may also do a very good job of snuffing this thing out and it just disappears. But we don't have enough information on that right now to, to be certain uh, what direction it's going to go. But I would be prepared uh, to confront this virus in the long term. Yeah, and Dr. Topham, this is where I think your answer, even though let's face it, to some degree we're speculating on this, I think you're giving us really important information that a lot of us don't think about, which is that coronavirus is a separate category from an influenza virus, right. and it may not behave the same way. But given that, I know this is a speculation question, but once there's a vaccine, is there a concern that, like influenza, the vaccine will only be 30, 50, 60 percent effective, or, or are you more confident that once we get this vaccine, it'll have a higher effectiveness rate? I certainly don't expect 100 percent efficacy. Um, I think you have to ask yourself the question why we don't have uh, vaccines for seasonal coronaviruses. And part of the answer to that is they don't cause necessarily as severe a disease as this particular new coronavirus does. Um, so there's less incentive to create a vaccine. Um, however, um, having said that, uh, we don't know what the efficacy rate is going to be. Um, I, uh, like I said, I still don't think it'll be 100%. Um, I'd be happy with 50% because, again, you can use these vaccines in a widespread manner to create that herd immunity that will limit spread. And you can do, vaccines can do this in a way that doesn't cause the disease that the actual infection does. Uh, Ed asks the following, and I'll direct this to Dr. Branch. Is there ongoing collaboration among countries and scientific and medical communities in developing a vaccine? And Dr. Branch, as you mentioned earlier, dozens of trials going on, but Ed's curious to know, are you working together on them, or is it more of a competition-based system? So, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are about 115 vaccines in preclinical or clinical development. I would say the vast majority of those are currently being um, studied in, in North America and in Europe um, and in China. Um, one of the vaccines that we um, at the University of Rochester have approached the NIH about potentially studying something that um, we're optimistic may be a good candidate 
um, is a vaccine that was developed in England and is currently being studied in England. Um, and so there is some efforts to be collaborative um, and to not limit ourselves to only the things that um, are developed here in the United States and vice versa. I think COVID-19 is a global disease. Um, and even though there's this race to develop a vaccine in different parts of the world, um, ultimately, whatever vaccine we do develop that we find effective will have to be available worldwide. And so I think um, those collaborations are in place um, on a national and international level. And I think even on a local level, um, we are working locally with companies that are not based necessarily in the United States. Well, we're going to try to work in more of our viewer and listener questions as we bring in the Monroe County Commissioner of Public Health, and that is Dr. Michael Mendoza, who has been listening tonight and joining us via Skype. Dr. Mendoza, thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. How are you? Good evening, Evan. Good. How are you doing? Well, you know, I think we're all learning a lot tonight, and you've had a chance, I know, to hear from what the researchers are working on when it comes to the long process, but hopefully the fast process of creating not only vaccines, but the efforts of antivirals, understanding testing and tracing. Are there mm -hmm. specific milestones in research or testing or antiviral treatments that you are looking for before your recommended guidelines and even policy ideas might start to change or sort of move into different phases here? Well, you know, one of the principles I've always believed in is that we have to make sure that things work before we recommend them on a wide scale, uh, you know, across the community, because now, the last thing we want to do is is cause harm. And, you know, that's the approach that I've taken, whether it's in how we share data and how we communicate about the uncertainty that we're dealing with. And, and virtually all of the aspects of this epidemic so far, there, there have been more questions than there have been answers. And so I think what we're learning here tonight is the, the true science of trying to answer these questions really takes a long time. And, and I have to say that we are blessed in this community to be surrounded by so many brilliant people like what you're seeing here tonight. Uh, but the reality is that we are going to need to move forward uh, with a fair amount of uncertainty. And, and I think that's what is wearing thin uh, in the public. And I think that's the challenge that we all have to rally around to get through this together. Well, and, and let's just kind of get something out of the way here, which I think is important because sometimes in the last six weeks, there's this framing that it's public health versus the economy, as if, you know, on one side, you've got doctors who say stay close forever and everyone on the economy side says open yesterday. We all want to get open yesterday. We all want to be working. We all want to be engaging and being out in the public. We want to be going to festivals in Rochester. Does it frustrate you when we see this framing as if it's one or the other? It, it doesn't frustrate me because it's reality. You know, I was thinking this morning, you know, when we look at this sort of supposed dichotomy between health and, and the economy, the reality is that we're also dealing with uh, dichotomies within health and within the economy. You know, when I look at health and, uh, you know, I think we can say that we've pretty successfully flattened the curve, um, you know, that came at a cost, a health cost, which is that we've had to defer preventive care. We've had to defer surgeries that, you know, we can call them elective, but that doesn't mean that they're optional. You know, these are joint replacements. These are surgeries that if we uh, allow them to, to be deferred any longer, will become an emergency. And so even within the health sphere, um, there are choices that we have had to make, whether intentional or not. And then when you look at the economy and as we start to confront the questions about whether we open restaurants or bars or festivals or frontier field, you know, it's, it's like choosing between your kids. You know, it's really hard. And, uh, and those are the uncertainties that we still have to grapple with here as a community. And so let's talk a little bit more about that. And, you know, tomorrow on Connections, we're going to be talking about what it means to do a lot of telehealth and put a lot of those, as you call them, technically the category of elective surgeries on hold. Are we moving closer to uh, relaxing some of that, doing more elective surgeries, bringing more of, of what felt like where things were in early March? I think we have to, because the longer we go deferring this care, we will also inadvertently cause harm to our population because these are these are procedures that are important. These are procedures that, you know, somebody has recommended and patients have agreed to do and have chosen to wait. And, and uh, I think there is a there's an opportunity cost there in waiting to do something, even though it's called elective. Uh, and that is the challenge. And when it comes to even routine care for chronic illness, you know, I haven't seen a patient in a month, which is really the longest I've gone without seeing patients. And I, I know that my patients have chronic illnesses that they haven't been able to see us for. Um, and, and there's a cost in that. And so, you know, we cannot continue in this way forever. We've got to find a way to inch forward in a way that's 
you know, preserving safety and, and it doesn't unleash that surge that we very much know is possible if we do this too quickly. Absolutely. So two points on that. First of all, I'll invite you to break any news you like right now when it comes to any announcements on reopening or phases or your thoughts on that, uh, because we've had members of Congress on our programs this week saying May 15th or some debate about that. Where Do you have any dates in mind that, that stand out to you? You know, May 15th is the date that the governor has set as when New York pause is going to end. And, you know, I think it's pretty fair to, to read between the lines, as, you know, in what he's saying that, you know, some version of our society will reopen on May 15th. Now, there's a whole lot more questions than there are answers. Uh, tomorrow I'm meeting with Bob Duffy and we're going to talk about how do we inch forward uh, through this. You know, the county executive and I and all of our team, you know, we're trying to figure out what is the best way to lay uh, a, a path forward so that the, the public knows what to expect. You know, I think the hardest part about this is that there's so much that's uncertain. And while we can't necessarily predict the timeline, I think we can probably lay out the steps that we envision. You know, what are the things that we can open up that are lower risk, that are higher benefit, you know, that will allow us to, to experience, again, some semblance of normalcy that we all miss. You know, but then there are things that, uh, you know, we pretty much know are, are unlikely, like opening schools before the end of the school year, as much as we'd love to see that happen, I just don't see a path for that uh, any, uh, anymore. So, you know, you know, you never know. We'll see what happens. You know, I, I've been I've been proven wrong, you know, several times already uh, today, uh, let alone during this epidemic. And uh, you know, there's a lot that we're going to learn. And, and I think the openness toward uh, you know the humility of of being a scientist, I think, is what's on on display here tonight, and certainly uh, for all of us in public policy. Let's fit in a few listener and reviewer questions, knowing that, uh, you know, I know you'll answer as best you can, given the data we have. Leslie writes to us to say, I have a mother in an assisted living facility. What will it take for elder care facilities to reopen safely? Well, I think one of the important facets of that is that we need to do more testing. Uh, and just today, we've uh, developed a plan to deploy people to assisted living facilities and uh, adult care facilities to do more testing both of the residents and of the staff to see if we can find those cases of asymptomatic uh, infection. You know, our belief is that a lot of the infections in these congregate settings uh, began with the staff because most of the residents haven't, you know, been out that much. And so if we can find staff that inadvertently have become infected, let's do what we can to isolate them and protect the residents. I think that's something that, you know, as we go forward and sort of trying to prevent the second surge, you know, we've learned a lot by preventing the first surge. And I think we want to take what we've learned uh, and apply that going forward so that we're not driving uh, in the dark like we were the first time around. Sarah writes oh. to us to say, when things open up, will cleansing products and cleaning processes at gyms be strong enough to kill any germs between equipment uses? Would you say gyms would be safe if we wear masks, wash hands, and refrain from touching our faces? You know, I think there's no question that the new normal will be very different. Um, you know, I think there's still a lot that we're learning. We, you know, I do believe that fomite spread is very real with this virus. You know, but I think social distancing, no doubt, has made a difference. I think that's the reason why um, we are in the, you know, luxurious place where we are now, where we haven't had that far, you know, that that broad a, an infection in our community. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot that we're still learning, and. You know, gyms are hard because people are breathing more. And when they're breathing more, they're expiring more of those respiratory droplets. And I think there's going to be a lot more science that's going to have to go into how do we design gyms in a way that protects us. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing that says that the way we've been doing it uh, all along has been that wrong. Um, but I do think that we're going to have to reevaluate a lot. And, you know, do we reuse multi-use uh, items in a gym? Do we reuse multi-use uh, grocery bags? I mean, all these questions are ones that we're going to have to entertain again. And I think there's, again, a lot more questions than we have answers at this point. And about 90 seconds left here. Bonnie says, if people feel like they might have had the virus as far back as maybe January, is there a way to get the antibody test done? Understanding that random testing is occurring, is there a way to get an appointment for an antibody test? Right now, there is not. But I do think that in the coming weeks, we will see that. And so I would say, hang in there, Bonnie. You know, there is a chance that if you were ill in, in January, you might have had COVID-19. Although, you know, honestly, I think the, the chances are quite low. You know, back in January, we were dealing with a, a much higher prevalence of influenza. 
But, you know, there's always a possibility. So what I would say is, you know, I think the antibody tests will be coming in much greater numbers in the next uh, week or two. Uh, you know, sit tight and let's uh, try to get you that antibody test. Are you, uh, are you finding it important, about 30 seconds left, Dr. Mendoza, to continue to stress, as Ed Yong did in The Atlantic recently, that when we talk about, quote, reopening, it doesn't mean March 1st. It means continuing physical distancing, even if businesses are open, masking or face coverings, et cetera? Yes, I think social distancing has, be, has been a godsend, really. And I think we're going to have to preserve that in some fashion. And we're going to have to figure out how to do that in a way that protects the most vulnerable. You know, social distancing among older people is far more critical than it is for us younger people. But it's us younger people that are, are thought to be the vectors for infection for these older people. So we've got to find a way to incorporate social distancing in everything that we do. And that will no doubt be a very different place. And so that's why I think as we look ahead, this new normal is going to be one that we're going to be challenged with, and we have to work together to, to find that, what that new normal is. Dr. Mendoza, I could have read comments for about half an hour of people praising your work and the, the time that you've spent and the leadership you've shown. So I will just say on behalf of all the viewers and listeners feeling that way, thank you so much. Well, thanks for the privilege, and I will say that uh, our work is not done. So let's keep working on this together, and I'm very grateful for, uh, for the opportunity to, to do what I do. And thanks to all of their guests for their time and their remarkable work, not only Dr. Mendoza, but Doctors Nancy Bennett, Dr. Angela Branch, Dr. Ann Falsey, Dr. Dave Topham, and we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight for WXXI's Live Forum. You can find this broadcast and more coronavirus information and resources at WXXINews.org. Click on the Coronavirus tab right on the top of the page, and we want to know what you think of the program. Program. You can call our audience response line 258-0360, email forum at WXXI.org. I'm Evan Dawson. From all of us at WXXI, please stay safe and healthy. Good night. WXXI's live forum is made possible with support from the Greater Rochester Health Foundation, working to pursue and invest in solutions that build a healthier region where all people can thrive.